just as we're getting started, I wanted to let everyone know about the next stage of we're going through uh, these workshops and yes, to help us get prepared for um, procurement and working together industry clusters. But for those that had come to our capability statement workshop, we found we got a lot of questions about actually getting it done. And so even today with our financial health, we're looking at, you know, looking at our company and making sure that it's viable enough to take on certain contracts. So we, it, it was good timing because we were working on a project to get people to apply for the investment readiness program. And for those that know me, you know, I help with grant writing and also doing working groups around applications. And this investment readiness program, it helps you get between 10,000 to 100,000 for your social enterprise. And as black business owners, I want all of you to understand that you running your business, you are running it like a social enterprise and you should dive deep into that concept. Actually, I'll share with you my screen because, oh, I can't share it yet. So I'll check with Gavin. Can you see if I can share my screen? And then I'll show you what we're working on to help businesses really, I don't want to say handhold, but making sure that if you want this business to get certain types of grants or funding that's available to help you amplify what you're doing, we're going to be helping you to get those applications done and also to fine tune all areas of your business. So not just your capability statement and your financial health, but also your operations, um, understanding where you fit in that social enterprise, I'll say sweet spot in between a non-traditional nonprofit and a traditional for-profit. There is that space where a lot of the people I'm seeing familiar faces that do great work in the community, but you don't realize that you are operating a social enterprise and you have access to these this funding. So hold on, let me see if this is available. So I'll show you this boot camp that we put together. So working with the Community Foundations of Canada, they found that the last application, they had about 1,700 applications come in and they saw that about half of them weren't structured properly. So either people were trying to run nonprofits or they're running for profits and didn't have community impact. So what we did is we put together a six week program that'll take you step by step how to uh, structure your social enterprise, how to make it profitable and get you investment ready. And there's two streams. So for those that might still be in the ideation phase, I doubt many on this call would be, but if you know others that are, you have that option to really flush out your idea. If you are established and have been operating for a while, either getting close to profitability or already profitable, but now you want to expand and amplify what you're doing, we have a stream for you as well. And using, again, the expertise that already exists in our community, understanding how to bring on more team members, we help you with that. And then social enterprise, I truly believe is gonna change the landscape of Canada and the world in general, being able to use profit to actually impact the community something that we're already comfortable with doing, but we've never figured out how to make it sustainable. And a lot of times we put all this work into our companies and it's really draining. So being able to get these types of grants, get different types of funding to really take that stress off of your shoulders so that you can do the great work that you do and also grow your business. So just to run down over the next couple minutes, so there will be four modules. It's starting October the 24th. And you do see there is a cost for it. It's about $1,047. And I think that includes the, it's like 1100 with the Eventbrite fees. But if you are a member of the BBPA or if you're a member of ACBN, you do get access to this workshop for free. So it might be a great time to become a member because you'll save around like $600. And so the modules that we're going to cover, again, week one, going through that social enterprise sweet spot, making sure you understand where you fit in that landscape, because a lot of what you're doing, you might already be doing instinctively, but if you really structure it and be purposeful about your social enterprise, this next funding is between 10000 to to 100000 to really fine tune what you're doing. So we want to make sure that your application is as strong as possible, and we're going to help you with that 
through this workshop. So on Mondays, we, we work on your business operation. And then on Thursdays, we work on your actual application. So the next one for the investment readiness program is due October 9th. And it is going to open September 8th. So you do have some time to get prepared. But like I said, we want to make sure our community has the strongest applications possible so that there's no doubt that you'll be able to get the grant money. And going deeper into your revenue models, understanding your target clients. And again, there's two streams. So if you're in ideation, we're not going to drill you too hard on certain things. Like you still have to get the viable uh, idea out of your head and onto paper. But for those that are established, we want to make sure a lot of these business operations are foolproof and tight. And over these six weeks, we will help you do that. And then at the end, so during, sorry, where's week six? So during week six, we're going to also show you other funding opportunities that are available. There's different programs through the alternative savings and also different programs through new market funds and different funds that already exist for social enterprise that we may not have known about. And they're going to be doing presentations on how to get you even more money. And also, like I said, along the way, we're working on your application for the investment readiness program. So the investment readiness program is dispersed through the Community Foundations of Canada, and you're able to get between 10,000 to 100,000 to amplify your social enterprise and get you ready for the next stage, which is called the social finance fund. So the social finance fund is about $750 million that the government wants to invest into social enterprise. So this is where I'm talking about if you have a profitable business that is doing great work in the community, the government wants to make sure that you're able to amplify that business. So we've now put this together to make sure that your business operations is on point, profitable, and you have a clear uh, community mission and impact. And then we'll be, we're going to be able, we're, we are going to be able to get you these types of grants and also help you amplify your business. So I'll leave it there. If you did have any questions about it, let me know. Um, like I said, if you've been to our capability statement and then this financial health workshop, and after it, you wanted to do a bit of a more of a deep dive into your full business operations, this is available to you. But with that, oh, I did see somebody want to ask a question. Sure, go right ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Jamila. I'm actually connecting from um, Abbotsford, British Columbia. So I'm three hours awesome. ahead, probably behind a few. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, I love this event, especially because I've been looking at so many funding options for months and I am running a social enterprise and awesome. I am actually looking at applying for this. And so I've been looking for a mentor on how to apply. Just yesterday I was talking, I'm like, I, but the point I want to ask is, is this going to be offered online too? Because I can't be there in person. Yes. So this will totally be virtual. Oh, okay. There was a location there and I was like, uh oh. Oh, does it show a location? I didn't see that. Yeah, I think it's in Ontario. I didn't know you were there either. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Because this is our uh, co working space here in Brampton. Okay. But it, I do need to change that so it says Zoom online. So, yes, it will be online. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. And sorry, so the time is 12 to 5 on Mondays, and then on Thursdays, it'll be 6 to 8. So Monday is strictly about your business operations, and then Thursday is specifically about the investment readiness program application that is opening September 8th and closing October 9th. So throughout the course, your application will be completely done. All right. And so I want to check if Michael was ready and want to. Yes, Michael is ready. He's on. Awesome. Oh, wait, so I don't need to share. <laughs> or you can just read his bio. I'll read it for you. So I'm really excited to have Michael Pinnock online with us today to host us through the financial health section. I've been able to talk with Michael a bit and getting tidbits of knowledge when it goes into accounting and having proper budgets and cash flow projections is very, very instrumental to our businesses. And Michael, so I'll go through his bio and then I will turn it over to him. So Michael Pinnock is a fellow chartered a professional accountant, FCPA, currently the principal of his firm with license to practice public accounting in Canada, US and Jamaica. 
Michael has distinguished himself as an astute accountant providing assurance and consultancy services to organizations and businesses, both local and international. He has built solid, consistent relationships with his clients and offers timely, valuable, and practical solutions to their business needs. A native of Jamaica, Michael immigrated to Canada in 2002 and spent the initial 10 years with the regional municipality in its corporate finance department, where as a senior budget advisor, he played pivotal roles in supporting a number of initiatives as subject matter expert. A firm believer in giving back, oh, he's sharing, I'm sorry. <laughs> a firm believer in giving back and a consummate volunteer, Michael's hobby is to support charities and not-for-profits by providing pro bono financial statement audits and financial advice. He is currently the treasurer at the Black Business and Professional Association, the BBPA. His other charitable activities include board and committee work with the Ontario Trillium Foundation, York Region Children's Aid Society, and York Regional Police as well as treasurer for a number of charitable organizations. In addition, to, for over 16 years, he has served CPA Ontario as a tax preparer with its annual tax clinic and other volunteer work on panels. And if you have some extra time, Michael, I might want to add in ACBN as one of the orga nonprofit organizations you work with. But I don't want to overload you, so I will leave it to you. Thank you so much for being here. And without further ado, is Michael Pinnock for the Financial Health Workshop. Good morning, and thanks for having me. Thanks for those kind words, Ryan. Um, as you age, you realize that you hopefully leave some sort of footprint, and folks can talk for five minutes about it like you've just done. Um, of all the things that you've just said there, one of the stuff I like to pride myself in is to provide practical solutions uh, because we can do a lot of talking we can do a lot of reading uh, but sometimes we rarely uh, make that next step to implement what we do so I, I like to believe um, I provide practical solutions and so at the end of uh, today's presentation I would hope to leave with the participants um, some practical stuff that they can do as they go forward. Now, um, prior to coming on, you spend a lot of time speaking about business. But today, I'd like to look at the personal side first, and then I'll show that it is similar to business. So I'm going to spend some time talking about uh, financial health as it relates to individuals, and then we'll make that transition as how it relates to, to business. And so I'd like to start by um, also emphasizing that I'm the treasurer of the, uh, the Black Business and Professional Association. And um, as a little plug for the association, we have been around for 38 years, and our main focus is to assist Black business and professionals to navigate this very hostile environment uh, that we live in as a black community. And so in a nutshell, we provide everything that is needed. And as, as the advertising go, if we don't have it, we'll get it. So you can go on our website, bbp.org. You'll see the programs that we offer there. Okay, I'd like to, to approach today's presentation in three parts. And I hope the internet is working. You guys are all hearing me. Thumbs up and it's all good because sometimes we have problems on this side uh, with the internet. It's all good, Ryan? Yeah, so far good on my end. If anybody's having trouble, just put it in the uh, chat. Okay. So I'd like to take, uh, I'd like to do the presentation in three parts. Part one, let's look at the technical nature of what is considered financial health. What are the elements that make up financial health? How is it measured? How is it used? How can we benefit from it? How does it impact our, our, our lives? Part two, I want to put it in a cultural context. I always like to do this. How does it impact Black community? What is our history? What is our experience? And 
what is the way forward from an historical perspective. And then finally, I'd hope to leave uh, some options, some things that I think we can do that will uh, provide some guidance and some practical ways of doing stuff as we go forward. Okay, so let's get into the tech. And I've got a slide up there. Let's go to slide two. That speaks about the definition, just a plain technical definition. What is, a, you know, what is financial health? And um, I was thinking as I decided to, uh, to do the presentation, whether I should allow folks to ask questions as I go along or wait for the end of the program to ask questions. But I'm just throwing it out there for those who want to think about it. How would you define financial health? And you know, while you ponder that, you know, I offer a definition. And there's always a good textbook definition, and there's always the one that you know we can feel as a practical stuff. So the financial health is, is a term used to describe one's personal monetary affairs. As the same thing in business. When you talk about the financial health of the business, you're talking about their monetary affairs. But in simple terms, the financial health is like physical health, it's your well-being. It's your financial well-being. If you get up this morning and you don't feel healthy, you, you don't feel strong, you don't feel energized and energetic, then one would see you are in poor health and you may not be able to withstand the challenges of the day. Similarly, with uh, financial health, it's looking at the well-being, your financial well-being. Let's look at how it's measured, because uh, one of the stuff I like to see is we currently work in what is called the free market environment, the economic business model that is used as we speak. It's called free market system. And the word free doesn't mean you get things for free or you do things for free. What it means is that you are free from any encumbrances to get into the market and to do stuff that you want to do. Ryan was just mentioning earlier some of the programs that are available for our community to participate and to build social enterprises. And the word free in this context connotes that you're free to enter the market and you're free to exit the market. And the market is as any market is, if you can think of a common, the, the farmer's market, it's a place that brings buyers and sellers and they agree on price and the move goods, consumers and producers. So in measuring financial health, we also use that market approach and we come up with an index and that index will tell us whether or not we are in good financial health or in bad financial health. So for those who are uh, familiar with uh, chemistry, there's a stuff they call a litmus test. If you stick a litmus paper in a solution and it turns red, it tells you that it's acidic. And if you put it in another solution and it turns blue, it tells you that it's alkalinic. And so it gives you a feel as to whether the thing will burn you or it's soapy. Same thing with your physical health. You go to the doctor, the doctor will check your blood pressure, they'll check it and they'll, make, they'll take your weight, your height, et cetera, et cetera. And based on those parameters, the doctor will see you're in good physical health. Same thing in financial health. There's an index that we use that sort of see to us depending on where you are and that index, you're in good financial health or you are in not so good financial health. And the term we use is your net worth. Your net worth is the term we use to measure your financial health. When we talk about business, we talk about the equity 
in the business. And for not-for-profit, we talk about the net assets in the business because no one really owns a not-for-profit, so it's a net asset. So it's a similar index we use. So on the individual level, how that index is measured is you take all the stuff you own and you take away or you minus, you less from all the stuff you own, all the stuff you owe. And in accounting, which is the language of business, which is what we ought to know, and I'll talk about that a little more later, what you own is called your assets. And what you owe is called your liabilities. So if you have got more liabilities than asset, you're in a negative net worth. And what that means is that you're not as financial healthy as you should be. But if you have got the reverse or the converse of that, if you've got more assets, more things you own as compared to things you owe, or the amount of obligations you have, then you are in a better financial health. And why is this important? Uh, for a number of reasons. But the main one, I think, is so that as individuals, we can pursue our passion. The stronger our financial health is the more we have extra funds to do some of the things we need to do on a personal level. It can make us a little happier than we were before. All right, so let's now look at some of the elements that make up the things we own. And again, these are assets. Uh, one of the primary one, and you'll see me going back to this during this presentation, is honing of property through your personal residence or through owning land, um, owning you know, real, real assets like gold and silver, and, you know, your car, have investments. These are firm, tangible things that is a good element of part of your network. What are some of the things that you may owe? Not a major one is, is a mortgage, or if you have outstanding rent to pay. You may have various loans, you know, car loan, you may have a student loan, you know, other personal loans. Um, certainly in the black community, one of the major things we owe is credit card balances. Uh, that that is, is, a, is, a, is a prominent feature of the black community. If we own nothing else, we tend to hold credit card balances or PD loan. And I think they're throwing audit in here because I'm an accountant. That's, just, <laughs> that's not who the audit fee. So these are the technical parts that I want to look at. Very simple, very straightforward. Your financial health is measured by your net worth. Your net worth is calculated by taking all the stuff you own and less all the stuff you owe. And that gives you a number. And what are the elements of the things you own and the things you owe? At least a few of them there, but you can think of other stuff that you own and other stuff that you own. And those are the numbers that we use to compute your network. Networked. So the things you own are sources of wealth. And, and, and for those who may not know, there is a difference, a fundamental difference between rich and wealth. Um, if you put a number to it, it's you know, a person of a million dollars, he's a rich person. A person of a million dollars that is multiplying and generating more millions of dollars for himself or for his family or his business. He's a wealthy person. So the Oxford Dictionary will tell you that rich is opulence. You know, it's just kind of like on the surface. But wealth is, is, is prosperity. It's enduring. It's long lasting. And that is why we are focusing on wealth as against riches. So let's look at the sources of wealth. <clears throat> From time immemorial, going as far back as you can take, land has always been 
a source of wealth. Nations go to war over accumulating more land. And when we talk about land here now, we're talking about things that are included in land, like the waterways, the rivers, the sea, the minerals in the earth, all of these in the buildings that we put in it, all of these stuff are considered a part of land. So ownership of land and using land to generate wealth is one of the main source and the primary source, as I say, going back. And the returns for owning land and for using land, the income you get from those things um, is called rent. Outside of when you use it for mining or agriculture or stuff like that. Um, but if you just own land and you, 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 you rent the land to someone to use, the, in, the, the input you get, the, the revenue from that is called rent. And so that is the first major source of um, land. The next source of wealth is uh, our labor. And some folks don't think about it, but you'll see a little later that uh, during this time of um, our shattered slavery, the slave master did know that labor was an important source of wealth. And that is why we are always, you know, we're doing, we're on the plantations working and doing what we have to do. Now, labor is just classic labor. But in the current contemporary time, we tend to, spe we tend to differentiate between general labor or just unskilled labor and specific, more skilled labor. A doctor, a lawyer, a dentist, an accountant, a truck driver, you know, a technocrat, a, you know, a professional, you know, scientists, architects, all those folks. It is their labor that they use to generate their wealth. But we sometimes don't see it like that because we think about labor as being only the unskilled. But even me speaking here as, as a professional accountant, I survive primarily on applying my labor, my skill set, the knowledge I have, etc., to the work I do. So labor is the sec second, or it's as equal as land, but it's the next source of wealth. So you have land ownership of land, use of land, good source of wealth. You have labor, either individual labor or access to labor. So for example, the big conglomerates we see now, take, a, take a, 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 a Microsoft. It started out with probably one or two guys building one computer. But what drives their wealth right now is millions of people working all over the world, not only building the physical computers, but using their technical skills and their mental knowledge to improve on the software that they generate. Yeah, but we don't see them as labor, we see them as professionals or engineers, but it's labor. The second source, the third source of wealth is everything that is not labor our land. And we use, you know, all sort of terms for it as we go along. Entrepreneur is one of the big words we hear from time to time. You know, I'm an entrepreneur and, and so. But what it really means is that anything that does not fit neatly into just pure land and poor um, labor is a source of wealth. And in, in, in the free market that we live, we have created so much different sources of wealth. Um, way back when we started out as individuals running a little business, sole proprietorship, um, you know, families used to do their own stuff. But as the business grew, we realized we can't do it alone. We need a partner. So we go with another guy or two other guys and we create a partnership. And as business even grow larger, especially during uh, the, the mid to late 18th century, the Industrial Revolution, we realize no longer can an individual or, or two guys do it. We have to have big corporations. And so we create these massive corporations and to support these corporations, we had um, a, 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 what is called a stock exchange that was designed to support the growth of those corporations. 
because without getting too deep into the technical nature of corporation, what it does, the individual owns everything and carry all the liability. The partners share the ownership and the risk, but they also share the liability. In a corporation, the government create an entity which says you do not have to share the liability except to the extent that you own a part of that company. So if you wanted a million dollar, you go out and you get one million person to give you a dollar each. Each of those persons would only have one dollar risk in that business, but you're able to generate a million dollar to run the business. So this part we tend to plump in what is called capital. So we have the land, we have the labor, and we have the capital. And as I see in modern time, capital come in different forms. In a corporation, the revenue you get from being an owner is called dividends. You may loan some money to the corporation, you get interest for that. You may come up with an invention that you put out in the market and folks can use it. That gives you royalty. You may have something like a Dunkin' Donuts or a Tim Hortons that we have in Canada here and you franchise it throughout different uses and you get franchise fees to build it. Um, you write a manuscript or you write a book or you come up with a technique and you pattern that technique so that people have to pay you to use it. And you look at the, you know, the market now, there's the, the Wall Street and the Bay Street and there's tons of people down there doing a lot of stuff and generating a lot of wealth by using their technique and their know-how and their knowledge as a form of capital. You've got the banking system that will loan you money to get business going and they get a, a payment through interest payment and that is form part of capital. So just to recap this section, the three sources of real wealth is land and its ownership and use, labor or ability to do stuff, and everything else that is not land or labor that enhance that process to generate wealth. And one of the miracles of labor, for example, is you do not need to spend 10 hours to generate 10,000 hours of surplus. So like you're, you're taking care of a farm, for example, and you may plant a, a bushel of peas, but that bushel of peas will generate tons and tons of peas. So labor, when combined with land and other sources of, of, of wealth generation, actually multiply on itself. The next chart I want to show is uh, how we use some of the wealth that we have right now. And I didn't want to put specific dollar figure to this chart, lest it create um, more anxieties and confusion. What you can do, you can look at this chart and to see in your own personal life or in your own business, how you're spending, how you're using the wealth that you generate. Mortgage rent is about 40%, utilities about 10, um, internet, telephone, cable, that sort of stuff is about 60. Transportation in terms of public transportation or even owning a car works out to be about 23%. And your food is about 11. I did not put entertainment here. Uh, that is something we also do. Um, Maslow and those who are familiar with Maslow hierarchy of needs. Um, always mention that uh, you have to satisfy the lower level needs first, which is your physiological um, and mental stuff before you go on to the other level. So entertainment is actually one of those stuff that we, we must do. And you can see now in the COVID time, um, people are getting some psychological challenges now because they've been locked down for so long. They haven't got a chance to really go out and entertain and do stuff. So that is part of our natural needs, but it's not here. So you can look at this and see, when we generate the wealth, this is kind of how we, at the base, spend the wealth. And if we generate more wealth than we need to spend, we have a positive net worth. 
And that positive network can help us to do other things, including sustaining any big shocks. And this is something about having good positive network. Um, here again, COVID is a classic example. How many business or how many individuals can survive for more than six months or 12 months or 18 months or even 24 months without start to feel in a pinch of not being working, not generating income over this time. So if you have a good net worth, it also creates a cushion for the rainy day so you can proceed until things come back to normal. All right. Um, and I don't know if I need to pause and take any quick question anyone may have on the technical one before I move into the cultural context that I'd like to put it in. And then finally into uh, what are some of the options we have to generate wealth in terms of individual or our business. Yeah, we could do a quick pause. And if anybody has, sort of, I didn't see any questions in the chat specifically. Bear in mind, mm. this is just the technical part, which is not complex. It's very simple true, and true. straightforward. And that is what you'll find in nature. The technical parts of stuff are very simple. It's when we put people, when we add people to the equation, then we bring all the challenges that people have to that equation. So hopefully when I do, mm -hmm. the, the culture, the people part, it may generate some questions and queries and so on. All right. Yeah, I feel like we're good to go. go okay. Forward. So I would like to start with a quote from Albert Einstein. And, and, and those in the science field would know about this man, supposed to be the bright, brightest man ever. He came up with um, MC Square, which is the basis we use to do a lot of stuff, which is mass is equal to energy. Energy is equal to mass times the speed of light square. And that was a very, very important discovery in the field of science. And because if you're bright in science, people believe you're bright in everything else. We always seek to find quotes from these folks. So it starts by saying, if I had an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on that problem, I would spend the first 55 minutes determining the proper question to ask. For once I know the proper question, I could solve the problem in less than five minutes. So as I go through this quote and prepare for this presentation, what pops in my head is, what is the proper question to ask about financial health and financial health as it perturbs to our people, our community? And so I went through a number of questions and the one that I landed on was, how do we enhance our financial health. How do we as individuals and as a community build, grow, enhance, preserve, sustain, and be able to pass down that wealth to the next generation? How do we do that? And I hope that's a proper question. So having pose that question, I want to put it in a context. I want to look at it through the history of black folks in the Americas and in the Caribbean. Because as you started out by saying earlier, Ryan, we're talking about funding that is available through government that we in the black community can access to do stuff like social enterprise building. And so we can do more things for our community and for ourselves. So the first thing I want to, to remind the participants about is that Blacks weren't legally, Blacks were prevented legally from building wealth. We were, for the better part of our lives in this side of the world, we weren't legally allowed to build wealth. And that went on from uh, the mid 
14th, 15th century, right up to 1838 in the English-speaking Caribbean and up to 1865 in the Americas as we know it, after the Civil War in America. So when we talk about financial health and we talk about network, we were zero up to that time. And that is one of the first historical contexts in which I want us to, to look at how we deal with financial health, um, you know, how we can generate wealth, how we can use the wealth, how we can pass the wealth down to our, our, our next generation, our heirs and successors. Because we are starting out at an handicap. The folks before us had hundreds of years to do what they do and to build the wealth. And, and, and just as a reminder, when the slaves were made free, in the Caribbean, they got absolutely nothing. But the former slave masters got 20 million pounds so that their wealth was retained. They had to give up wealth in terms of the black labor but their network did not go down because they were compensated for the loss of property to the tune of 20 million pounds. In the United States and the Americas, they supposedly should have gotten 40 acres of land and a mule. But it took away the 40 acres of land about a year or two after it was given to them. So they themselves end up zero. And so that's the first context I want us to look at this uh, financial health and, and, and the measurement of that health and where we're coming from. I prepare a simple chart here to show that if you're born in the baby boomers time like myself, you are probably the sixth, the fifth or the sixth generation since slavery. So your greater, greater grandparents would have been slave. And remember, once they freed us, all we owned was our lives, not even the clothes on our backs. No education, no land, no, no nothing. No, all we had was our, our labor now to use to generate wealth. And um, not so much in the Caribbean, but in the Americas, after slavery, there were laws that were put in place that ensured that black folks, former slaves, weren't allowed to build wealth. There were actual laws which says you could not buy land, which as I say is an important um, source of wealth. You could not buy a car of a certain value, which again is another source of wealth. You could not work in any job, which is a source of wealth, which is your labor. And even if you work in a job, you could not leave it easily to get a better job. Um, one of the major law they had passed is that you weren't allowed to pass down any kind of wealth. So we end up consuming a lot of what we work, just spending it and spending it because we, we couldn't pass it down. You know, you can always look on history books about the Drinko law of the South and some of the, the laws that we, we have in, um, in the Caribbean. And I'll mention a few of them later, how it affects us even current days, when we talk about banking and getting loans and so on. How some of those very laws that started way back in the early 19th century is still on the books and is still being applied. Okay, um, and something I missed that I really should have said earlier. Prior to 1838, when we got freedom, August 1st, 1838, 1834, they had passed what they called the Amelioration Act. And that act was designed, in essence, to teach the slaves how to be free. There was a feeling that if uh, you couldn't be a slave to the, you know, um, what is it? It's July 31st, 1838, you're a slave. And then the 1st of August, 1838, you're a free man. You want to know how to do with the freedom. 
And that is what they taught. And so they believe that you need a training period from 1834 to 1838 to train us how to generate wealth, how to earn money, how to measure our network, and those kinds of stuff. And even now, if you, if you think about some of the challenges the black community have, we still seem to, people want to teach us how to generate wealth and how to pass it down to our heirs and successors. So where have we been since the first generation and the fifth generation, the sixth generation in terms of measuring that net worth? So let's look and see where we're at. I did a quick search to see what we have achieved over that 182 years. And I did a search on the richest black folks we have. Just the top 10 I wanted to see. And so, Ali Kodangote seemed to be the richest man, and he's a Nigerian. And his net worth is 10.9 billion. But if we come closer to the Americas and the Caribbean, the richest black person is Oprah Winfrey right now, as measured by this net worth. And she's number five at 2.7 billion. Michael Jordan is number seven at 1.9 billion. And Jay-Z is number 10 at 1 billion. So over the last six generations, we have moved from zero to number 10 and number seven and number five. We have got net worth now, which is zero and 2.7 billion. And just by contrast, don't want to spend any time on it, but just by contrast, look at the number 10 of the richest white folks in the world. We're all in the Americas to, be, to, 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 to understand. Michael Bloomberg, he's 54.9 billion, 54.9 billion. So he's five times higher than our top guy. And yet he's number 10 in that group. You compare him to our best person, 2.7. And you'll see 54.9 divided by the 2.7. That's 20 times. Now, the point I want to make here and I want to throw for us to consider is we have got the same training, we have got the same ability, we have got the same opportunity, if that's the case. And so why is there this big gap? And I'd like to, to suggest that one of the reasons for the big gap is we started an handicap. We started out way behind the starting pole for what we do, but we have still gotten to some place, okay? We're in a sweet spot now that uh, we can do better stuff. I'd like to touch on some of the, um, some of the stuff that affects us that is not written. One of the things I see to, to, to my community as individual and as a community. When we talk about financial health and we talk about running a business, which is what Ryan spoke about earlier, how do we get business up and running? And I always suggest to them that folks, you need to know the rules of the game. You need to know the rules of the game. And I'm just gonna mention two rules that a lot of time passes and we really don't realize the impact they have on us. Recall I mentioned that land is a primary source of wealth and wealth generation. Ownership of land is very important. So one of the best thing we can do as, as individual, as company, and even as business, is to own land so we can use it to generate wealth. And most of our people started out by renting property. And you'd rent the property for, I don't know, 20 years. Sometimes a whole generation live in rented property, and then it's the next generation that is able to see if they can buy a piece of property or own their own home. And they look at what is called, you go to the bank to get a mortgage, and the bank is looking at your credit score and, and this, this stuff about a credit score is really another set of index that is used in the free market to 
determine one's ability or capacity, one's practice over the last little while to repay liabilities, to repay obligation that you generate. So if you have a good credit score, it means that you're reliable to repay. If you don't have a good credit score, it means we can't trust you to repay. So for us to give you the loan, we have to probably move up the interest rate, or we have to ask to make a higher down payment, et cetera, et cetera. And one would believe that paying rent, never late, never absent, never short. And most of the time, the rent you pay is a little higher than the mortgage that you'll pay. Yet your rent payment pattern is not counted as part of your credit score. You could show them all the rent receipts you have and you get it, the landlord to send an affidavit about your, you know, your pattern of payment and the fact that it's perfect, it's immaculate. It's not considered a part of your credit score for the purchases of a prime land. And that's historic and that's systemic. It's part of the rules that's coming from way back where the black folks, the ex-slaves, were not allowed to own property. They should live in rented property all their life. And that rule was written in many years ago, and it's still there. And if you talk to, you know, to a banking executive, he will tell you, oh, that's a rule. He, he or she probably haven't researched why it's there. But they say, listen, you know, it's not counted, so you know, we can't talk about it. you have to find. What they measure you on is a credit card balance that you owe $50 on and you miss a couple of payments. And that will bring down your credit score really, really bad. Not the rent that you pay, which is $1,500 or $1,700 every month for 20 years. So that is one of the rules. And so that, you know, I always say to folks, you have to know the rules so you can work within the system. Another one um, has to do with labor. And I always see the folks, I always do this calculation. And I'm going to ask folks on the presentation to do a quick calculation for me. If you, <coughs> sorry, if you wanted to make a million dollars and you work to you work every day of the week, not including the weekends. How much money per hour would you need to work in order to make a million dollars? I'm talking about labor now. I just talk about land and the difficulty in getting land because of some of the unwritten rules that we don't know about that is there. You're a worker, you're using your skill set as a teacher, a lawyer, a doctor dentist, an engineer, truck driver, painter, what have you. How much money you need to work per hour? I'm going to use 261 days, which is 365 less the 104 uh, <coughs> weekends. And you're going to work seven hours a day, just seven hours a day for 261 days. What is your rate of pay per hour you should make? in order to make a million dollars. I know somebody wanted to send it up in the chat as to what is that dollar figure. It's just arithmetic we're doing here. Okay. $547. Ah, no, that's a huge number. Let's do it again. It's 261 days times seven hours per day. What is the total hours you'll have? 261 days times seven. So it's 18, 27 hours you'll work for the year. Divide that by the million dollar. 18, 27. You have to work $547.35 an hour to make a million dollar. And that's before taxes. And you look in your community and ask yourself, who in your community consistently 
can work that sort of money. You know, is it the painter? Is it the doctor? Is it the lawyer? Is it the dentist? Is it the accountants like myself, et cetera, et cetera? So in order to be rich and then to create wealth from your labor, you'll find that you have to be in a high yield person. $547.35. Last time we checked, average holy salary is running about $65. <clears throat> yes, you do have people on the outlayers that make $1,000 an hour and so on, but you know, the average middle class folks is, is working in a family where both persons are working. The average hourly rate is about $130, $150. So right away, we see that in this environment, your labor alone won't necessarily get you where you want to be in generating wealth. OK? And so another thing that bankers will ask you when you go to get a loan, either for your business or personal, they do not like to use self-employed income. They do not like to do self-employed income. And so that's one of the rules that is coming from way back when. That's one of the rules that's coming from way back when. Sorry, sorry guys, I just think my box is gonna go dead in me and I don't see my support inside here. Uh, let me just traverse quickly before it goes dead. So again, you know, you go to the bank for a loan and the bank will say to you, we don't like to use self-employed income because it can be changed, it's variable, it's what you report. What they prefer you providing to them is two pay slips. So again, what they're saying to you, you should be working for someone even if it's yourself. And again, that is one of the stuff that is coming through the decades, that you weren't allowed to generate your own wealth, and you weren't allowed to create it by working for yourself. You have to be working, and these are some of the rules that are still in the system. So that is just two examples I, I pull on to see how do we create wealth and how do we sustain it in our community. And so I like to transition into my third area now. What are sort of some of the options that we have? And I, I say all of this from an historical perspective, not to daunt us as people, because we're very resilient. We see that we started with zero, and the lowest person in our field right now is GZ, is a million network. And there are thousands of other folks who have positive network that is not a million dollar, but it's still positive network. So what are some of the options I think we can apply to, to generate wealth, to have a good financial health, and to have a good network. Um, and I'm going to quote from another a managerial folks, call him Peter Drucker. He says, if it's not managed, it's not measured. If it's not measured, it's not managed. And so one of the challenges we have in say, Canada right now, we can't get any information on our people. You can't get it in the school. You can't get it in the penal system. You know, the two extremes. Nobody can tell you in any definitive term where all people are, what is it they're doing, et cetera, et cetera. Because part of the process is that if you don't measure it, you don't need to manage it or you can't manage it. So, you know, one thing we need to do is start to get that kind of data so we know what we need to do and how we need to do it. So there are just four recommendations I'm going to make. We need to start to own property. We need to start to own real estate and real properties. If you can't own it with a direct title, let's own it through other people, through the stock exchange. Let's invest in, in companies that the economic base has to do with property. Down in the Caribbean, there's tons of hotels all over the place, up and down down there, and a lot of those companies are public health companies. Let's start to invest some money in those companies, buy some shares and some stocks, 
some mutual funds and so on that have as its base property ownership. Next thing is our personal labor. Improve on our personal labor through formal education. Let's get more of our kids into the university. And if you start a business and you didn't get a chance to go to university, let's go back to some of the evening classes, go back, do some, some courses, some seminars, learn the real language of business, learn accounting, learn marketing, learn operations, learn to do you know, selling, buying and selling that stuff in a formal way, improve our skill set as, as individuals. Increase the investment as against the consumption. It, you know, what folk can own 300 pairs of shoe, but when you compute the network, those pairs of shoe is not counted as an asset in what you do. You know, it's just something, it's a consumption, it's a product you buy now and it will disappear. Okay. Um, and watch your consumption. Finally, and, and this is a very key, I think, start to spend, invest, and, and, and consume within the black community. Let that dollar turn around from zero. Don't just let it come in and go out. We have done it before, you know? I'm going there. The battery's going there. Yeah. So um, cons let's just spend the money in the, in the black community some more. And we're not saying, let's not spend it in the other community. You know? That's not what they're saying. But everybody is focusing on their community. And listen, don't let folks tell it can't be done. The Black Wall Street demonstrate that it can be done. It was done successfully. And we know what happened to the Black Wall Street. Just like the freedom towns that they have. Whenever you're successful, something happens, they come and they burn it to the ground. But we can do it. The social enterprise that you're talking about, that is how you do this stuff. That is how you get, get the money to turn around more in the community. Spend a little more in the community. And I read an article, uh, by the way, I didn't read the article itself, just the headline. And this, this, this black lady was writing and she started off by saying, if you want us to buy black, treat us good. Yeah, on the surface, that's beautiful. It's, it's, that's a reasonable request. But the question I ask after that, what is happening in the other community that you spend your money? How good are they treating you? And what is the result of all that spending over there? How are you building wealth, creating a net worth, having enough funds that you can pass down to the next generation? Or are you just consuming? So the top four stuff I mentioned is very generic. I didn't want to pinpoint any specific way of doing it, lest I get myself in trouble by calling out specific investments and so on. But generally, in, in, you know, invest in property, improve your, your, your personal uh, um, skill set as an individual, improve your education in particular, you know, increase the consumption uh, investment as against uh, consumption, spend more in our community, and finally innovate as we always do. You know, innovate. <laughs> I'm gonna leave you with a story from the Caribbean. When the slaves were freed in the Caribbean, and I can speak about Jamaica in particular, they, they had no, no wealth, but you know, just a labor, and what they knew, they were, weren't stupid people, they were very bright people. And two things that came up, two innovations they came up with, that still work now in a different form. One is what we call a partner, where five or six of us come together and we decide each week we're gonna put a dollar in a pool and every week somebody's gonna get that six dollar. You don't pay interest or you don't earn interest, but every week somebody has six dollars that they can use to do things. That is how they were able to pool funds to buy property in Jamaica. 100 or 200 have come together, the property is worth um, 10 pounds, and they all come together and put that 10 pound on this person buy this property this week. Next week, another person buy another property. And they call it a partner, a partnership. 
Same thing to do with cleaning house. I see mermaid doing that now. Rather than one person try to, to clean the great house, 200 women go there in an half an hour to clean the whole great house. And they were able to move from one great house to the next in one day. They're able to clean more than one great houses in one day by pooling the labor. And so some of the stuff that Ryan mentioned earlier about the social enterprise, and talking about building a cooperative, you know, building society and all those kinds of stuff. That's the way we go to improve our financial health. So in conclusion and just recapping, uh, we look at the technical nature. What is it? It's an index that measure our well-being financially. It's what we own minus what we owe. Hopefully it's always positive. And I just didn't want to say that earlier, but I can trade you now. Lots of our people is in the negative. Um, but we should always remember um, the network is a, almost a personal decision. Just like a business side, what they want to do, what is their objective. Your net worth, how you, what you consider to be your worth is actually a very personal decision. Some folks are comfortable with a suit of clothes on the back. Others, the universe is not big enough. So you first have to tell yourself, what is it I'm trying to achieve as measured through my financial health in terms of my net worth? And work towards that. You know, never try to follow the Joneses though. Uh, you know where the Joneses lead you. Measure yourself against yourself and against the goals that you set. Yeah, it's always good to look at other people who have done it and you may want to emulate what they have done. But a good measure is to measure against yourself and your own objective. Because we all have different feelings and different stuff. Um, we talk about the technical stuff. I try to interject some cultural history and position in the black community. And I've provided uh, four or five options that we can apply that if applied properly, either individually or as a community, we should be able to generate, uh, enhance and grow our network. Thanks for listening. And I will try to answer any question or queries that you may have. All right, awesome. <clears throat> Sorry. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Pinnock. Um, the, so we do have time for questions. Again, in the chat, I didn't see anything specific, but you're able to unmute yourself to ask a question at this time before we close up. So well done. I'll make sure this is in there. Yeah. See, just for folks to understand this, Ryan, mm. I try to stay away from giving specific stuff about let's buy this investment, let's buy that investment, because there's a legal connotation to providing um, financial and that, that sort of advice on a program like this. Mm. But if folks want to get more details, just give me a link to the bbp.org. Uh, yes, go ahead. Question. Mm -hmm. oh, I Am I I'm able good. to ask a question? Sure, yes. Me. Okay. What's the difference between public and private business? Okay. So, if you recall, I mentioned in one of my slides that there were three forms of organizations that we have. We had the individual where you and your family just doing what you're doing. And then as the business grow, you may have to take on to yourself a, a, a partner to assist you in doing what you do. And then around about 1848, the government of England in particular created what they call a statutory human. And they call it a corporation. And there's all sorts of rules as to what you do. So a private corporation is one whose ownership shares is not traded to the public. 
only a handful of persons can own it, and it remains in that little group. But a public company is one that anyone can buy on the stock exchange. And it's separate from public in the sense that it's government owned. That's not the public they're talking about. The public utilities owned by governments and so on is not the public they're talking about. What they're talking about here for public is that one of them you can go to any stock broker and say, listen, I want to buy some shares in you know, the aluminum company or Ford Motor Company because they're issued publicly, while the other one, you can't get those shares to buy. They're just within a family or a group of people. So that's the fundamental difference between the private and the public. There's some other little rules, but that is a fundamental difference. Is it better to operate a business privately in terms of um, what you want to do? So does the government still, can the government still step in and direct you as to what you kind of do? Or can you just, is it more um, ownership when you do it privately? No. Well, once you go to the corporate form of, man, of governance, the government is all over you because the, gov the government created that entity. They exactly. created that entity specifically to allow, and if folks remember, the Hudson Bay Company, you yeah, talk about Hudson Bay in Canada here. Yeah. They is one, they're one of the oldest creation of a corporation. In fact, they were, they were part of the reason when they're doing their expedition in, expedition in the New World and in Africa. They wanted millions of pounds to do it. And they couldn't get that from an individual or a bunch of individuals. So the government created this form of, of, comp, of um, business to ensure that millions of folks would put you know, a dollar here, a dollar there, and they will get their $10 million to do what they do. But it's a creation of the government. So whether it's private or public, you're under the same, the same rules. Um, a little different when you go public, um, but it's basically the same rules. And so one of the benefits okay. of doing that, the government will tell you, one of the benefits of doing it is that your liability is limited to what you invest in the business. If you run as an individual, sole practitioner, sole proprietorship, or as a partnership, if the business tank, they can come for your personal house and your car. And in the very, very bad days, many, many centuries ago, they came for your family. But if you run a, a, a corporation, the corporation itself just fold, and all you'd lose is what you put in there as an investor or an equity share. But yes, the government has the right to, to come to you. Awesome, awesome. I did see a question come in. Hold on. There was a question around any tips on investing in the Caribbean, specifically Jamaica? And I'm going to do it very general now because we normally have a disclaimer because one of the things we see is that you shouldn't rely on things I see here. Let's you go do something and get burned and you sue me. So we always have that disclaimer. We always recommend you go to a trained professional and so on and so forth. But yeah, as I mentioned in the print properties, go to the Caribbean. A lot of Europeans are now invested. I mean, COVID has kind of put a little brakes on it somewhat. But prior to COVID, the complete north coast of, of Jamaica from Nigger Point to Marne Point was and all these hotels were foreign owned out of Europe. So yes, you go down there, you acquire land um, and there's a lot of land available all over down there. So yes, acquire land and go to other Caribbean countries. You know, CARICOM allow you as a Caribbean citizen to move freely. In, in, in the Caribbean islands and do stuff. So yeah, definitely invest in land. You know, it's, 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 it's the purest form of investment that really doesn't appreciate. Yes, you can, you can mess up the land with chemicals and so on and so forth. But generally speaking, land move from zero to one to two to three to four. You know, it tend to, to either stay steady or, um, or increase in value. Remember the earth is fixed. And the population seemed to be growing at a geometric rate. We are what, 7.6 billion or some big number like that. And remember, there was a time when we had 1 billion on this earth, and now we have 7.6. And the earth has not changed. 
you know, and even though we have built skyscraper where we're using more space in the air, land is still a very good investment. So the answer is yes. Awesome, awesome. Well, let me check if there's any other. Do you know, thank you. If you have dual citizenship, we can invest from Canada. Do you know if that's accurate? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, Canada's not hardly about dual citizenship. Mm -hmm. It's not something they ask you to give up, even though they're finding it now that sometimes the only time you know that there's so many Canadians out of the country is when there's a natural disaster or war someplace. They hear mm -hmm. that there's a million person out of the country. So they're, they're, they've come up with a few rules to kind of, you know, reduce the incidences of that. But I, I know that they're good. They're good for, for doing so. And we in the Caribbean, remember that we are Commonwealth citizens. And Canada is a Commonwealth country. So we really have very little problem in terms of doing things from Canada to, to any Caribbean country. We're all already part of the Commonwealth. Awesome. OK. And so I was in, asking in, about. Incidentally, incidentally, uh, Ryan, mm -hmm. the, the 30 New England states in America, from Maine all the way to Georgia, Still part of the, the Commonwealth, you know. In the U.S., they're still part of the Commonwealth. There's 13 of them. The 13 of them, the, what they call the New England states. Those were the one that British had control. You know what is the official title for New York? The Commonwealth of New York. <laughs> the official title for Massachusetts is the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Commonwealth of Georgia. I mean, they don't use it a lot, but they, they can always pull old rules and, um, and get back to it. But they're all Commonwealth um, states. Interesting. I have to go do some research. That's all. That, I had no idea. A few other things. That thing about not being able to transfer wealth, I did not know it either. I wanted to, I'm going to go do some research oh, no, on that. The, the, the Jim Crow laws, specifically mm -hmm. structure and one of the things I wanted to convey to my participants, who they get it, is that some of those laws are still embedded in the things we do now. Right. Because they didn't, they didn't take them off the books. They're still in what we do. Someone was on Fox the other day talking about, look at all the great things they have done. They have the Civil Rights Act of this and the Civil Rights Act of that. And he went through about 20 Civil Rights Act. What he's not seen is that all those acts was to counter the Jim Crow laws <laughs> that was put there for no reason but to keep a section of the community as segregated. Right. Because remember, Ryan, and my participant, you do not need laws to do what is right. Laws are there to remind you of what you shouldn't do and what are the consequences of doing it. Mm. You don't need laws to do what is right. That is a natural stuff. You study every single law we have. Mm. Drive on the right because they don't want you to drive on the left. You know, stop at the stoplight because they don't want you to just drive through. Mm. It's not for you to do what is right, it's to remind you of what not to do. <laughs> it's, it's, it has a negative. So he started with all the civil rights acts because he had created anti civil rights laws. You know, you cancel them from the book and people just do what's natural. Awesome, awesome. I, question came in about how can we structure a savings for our children? So you talk about before we couldn't pass down wealth. What's a great way now to pass down wealth? One of the things I'd recommend folks to do on a practical basis, uh, look at how you, it's that little graph I gave there that 40% for this, 20% for that, etc. Go to your typical month's bill and see how you spend your funds and then create that surplus. And then um, in Canada here, there is a lot of um, instruments they have that allow you to save for your kids. And some of those instruments are tax-free. Like one that you can save to apply to college down the road and you get 5,000 tax-free window each year to do that. But you as, as, a, as an individual parent, I'd recommend you, you do investment that have tangible asset as its base. 
and then you, you set it up in a trust that will inure to your, your successes down the road. Nice, nice. And then there was, um, Muhammad found the pooling of money very interesting. And, and it's interesting because it's not a new concept, as you mentioned, it's how old, but you don't see a lot of black communities taking advantage of group ep economics or the idea, idea of community financing. And he's actually like, why is that? Is, what is the biggest barrier for this? Okay, so, and this, this, this is gonna be my personal philosophy now, and I've, mm -hmm. I've seen it at work at times. What we have to remember as a black community is it's only 182 years since we have been, they have removed shattered slavery. Now we're free, they have removed shattered slavery. But that was forced on them. That wasn't a gift they gave us because we were their engine of generating wealth. And so when they take us off, you know, the plantations back in the Caribbean or off the, in the cotton fields in the States, they lose an engine that generate wealth that they know had to pay. And so what they try to do legally is to create the laws, especially at the state level, not so much the federal level, but at the state level. They create these laws to ensure that you have to come back to work for them. And the system they have is not designed for us. In fact, a lot of the system is designed against us. But as things get more modern and you have the civil rights movement and people get a little more conscious, um, you notice the term that's flying around now is what they call unconscious bias. Well, you either have a bias or you don't. But it's a good palatable way to see to folks who have been doing things in a certain way for a long time that listen, guys, you should actually stop doing it now. And it's kind of little in to say, you know what, I didn't realize I was doing that. It was unconscious. But now I know I'm going to change. You know, so these, so the reason why, and again, I'm not picking on the banking system, but finance and capital, the ob of the system that we work in now called the free market. It is the flow of money, the flow of credit that makes the world run. That is why it's a challenge when you know Wall Street or Bay Street is not running. Right. Because it's not having a million dollar today that's important. It's been able to pay a million dollar over 20 years, which is credit and the flow of credit. Right. But it's not designed to encompass us. When they made those rules, we were slaves. We weren't even human beings. We weren't part of the, the factor. Not only were we not included, but a lot of women and minorities weren't included. Yes, yes. The Constitution of the U.S. didn't contemplate women or slaves in them. It's Caucasian male. Mm -hmm. Not even the sick or the handicapped or those folks were considered. That is why there's so many amendments. Right. There's more than 25 amendments in the Constitution just to bring it up to modern time. So my answer to that is that it's by, it's by design and sometimes they don't even know. You know, I sit over with a bank or a person who knows a lot. And I say, listen, you know, I'm paying rent for 20 years and I pay 1,700 a month for rent. I'm never late. I'm never short. Mm. I've never missed a payment. Why is that not an important thing for you to know if I'm gonna get a mortgage for $1,200? I thought that would be an important thing to know. Right. So people are you know, about the laws, the rules. And then the rules are coming from way back prior to all time. So, you know, my short answer is you have to change some of those rules. You know, because here's it, you know, I was surprised when I went to a bank the other day. There's no such concept in Canada as a building society. Okay. You know, in the Caribbean, it's ripple with building societies because those are for design for people to own property. Mm. You know, so you create a building society and all it is, is for you to put money inside there, the same part though. That started with a handful of guys. It's now institutionalized and there's a little more laws around it. But mm. the concept is the same. You know, a million person putting a dollar inside there, one person borrowed to buy, to buy a house. And the government give them favorable treatment. So, Taxes are a little low, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
cooperative is, is, is not a popular stuff. They use the term, but it's really a bank at, at a lower level. It's not a cooperative in the classic sense where the owners of that bank are the shareholders who have equity in the bank. Gotcha. But some of these things are still there. Remnants of what is good is still there and a lot of remnants of what is bad. And it's not just in the economic laws, in the penal codes and what have you. Yeah, there's some, some draconian laws still there about, there's still the one they call the, vacant, the Vagrancy Act. Mm. That is something that started in slavery where you should not be found off your plantation. Right. You can't work in a plantation A and find yourself on plantation B because you're planning a, a, a revolt. <laughs> and even after slavery, they still had the Vagrancy Act. Yes, yes. I thought I know we promised people that we'd wrap up around twelve thirty, okay. but I know this topic can go deep. Cool. And before we do wrap up, I did put in the chat the link for the uh, workshops that go deeper into business operations and the social enterprise funding. Yes. Understand that we are running social enterprises, so the funding that is being designed right now, you mm -hmm. want to make sure that you're tapped in. I always say position yourself in front of the flow of money and yeah. this money is going to be flowing at the end of this year. The next deadline is October 9th. So the code that I put in there, you're able to get 50% off by being a part of our community. If you are a paid member of the BBPA or of the uh, Afro-Caribbean Business Network, you would get access to the a workshop for free. So if you are a paid member, please get in contact with myself and I'll also send that out in the follow-up email for this workshop. So our next session is going to be August the 31st. And we so we are going to be talking about now industry alignment. So really understanding what industry you're in and making sure that we find more people in that industry to create stronger uh, applications and proposals going forward. And we're talking about partnership readiness. So our presenter will be Cassandra Dorrington, who is the executive director, is the executive director or president of CAMSLI, the Canadian Aboriginal and Minority Supplier Council, to walk us through how to properly get ready to create strategic alliances and these partnerships. So with that said, I again thank everyone for being on. And yeah, we'll see you on August 31st. That link is active. The same one that you registered with, you can now register for the next event. So August 31st, that's three weeks from now, 11 a.m. to 12.30. And before you run, Ryan, yes. why you just mention it, that's one of the way to create wealth. If you can pay 50% for doing something, don't pay 100%. Exactly. Strategic don't alliances don't be have to be yeah. the way we don't move forward. Definitely. No, again, this was awesome. I really appreciate it, Michael. So everyone, we'll talk to you soon. We'll see you in a few Beautiful. weeks. Great. All right.